I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. Today, you're going to learn what it's like to set up Race Flight 1 on a quadcopter for the very first time. Stay tuned. Race Flight 1 has recently gone into public beta, and in fact, if you have a Revolt or if you have the Schizo Race Flight board, which is essentially it's just a Revolt with a, with a different coat of paint on it, you can actually go right now to this URL, raceflight.net slash rf1 beta, and you can follow along in the steps that I'm going through, uh, and you can put Race Flight 1 on your copter and try it out uh, right now. And frankly, I think you should give it a go because so many people who've flown Race Flight 1 have told me absolutely amazing things about it that there's got to be something to it, right? Too many people are excited about it for there not to be something to it. So uh, today I'm going to get it installed on my copter and get it configured. We'll see how easy or hard that's going to be. And uh, then later I'll take it out and fly it. And we'll see what that's like. Now, if you're going to go through these steps, uh, I recommend you download the Race Flight 1 install guide by Destro. This is this PDF document right here that I'm going to be working through, uh, and uh, it will take you through all the steps that you need if my video isn't a perfect. Uh, I don't really intend this video as a tutorial because it's my first time going through this as well. So who am I to teach you to do it if I've never done it before? This is more a, uh, you know, a tour. <laughs> you can watch me muddle through and see how easy or hard it is. Uh, but if you want to actually follow along with some clear, concise, correct steps, this is the way to do it. I told you a little bit of a fib when I said that this is the first time I've done this. Um, I actually went through this all one time before and finished and realized I had, I had hit local streaming instead of local recording in my in my desktop recording software in other words i have been streaming to no one <laughs> and not recording so i actually have been through this before this is the first copter i've set this up on but if this feels a little bit rehearsed it's because it, it's the second time i've done this but i'm going to walk you through all the steps just as if i was the first time as best i can the first thing you need to do if you have a revolt and if you don't have race flight one already on it is you need to get Race Flight 1 on it. Race Flight 1 has a completely different driver architecture and, and configuration app than the old style Race Flight. And the first time you do it, you, you need to sort of bootstrap and get Race Flight 1 on the board in the first place. And the way you do that is you download this firmware, revolt1951.bin, and then you go into your Race Flight configurator, and you go to the firmware flasher, you load the local firmware, and you're going to flash this bin file. Use, this will be the last time that you use this Chrome app to interact with RaceFlight ever again. From now on, you're going to be using the RaceFlight 1 app. Now, in order to flash it, you need to have your RaceFlight 1 board attached in bootloader mode or DFU mode. Uh, so you're going to you're going to short the bootloader pins on the board or pads on the board. You're going to plug the board in. And then if you need to, you're going to do the Zadig WinUSB driver thing to, to make sure that you see DFU up here. Um, I've got a video about Zadig and drivers and stuff. It's, it's the same thing you have to do every time you try and get a new DFU device installed. The instructions for it actually don't even go to my video. My video is like 40 minutes long. Who wants that? You know, the steps are right in here in this install guide. And they're right here, and they give you very clear instructions on installing the Chrome app and doing the, the bootloader thing and the Zadig thing, etc., getting it all working. I have already done that. I already have Race Flight 1 on this board, and so you can see up here in the pull-down menu, it's showing the Race Flight 1 driver is present. So I do not need to go through those steps. I can skip right to the Race Flight 1 configurator app. The Race Flight 1 Configurator app is downloaded from here. You're going to download a zip file. Uh, if you have Windows 64-bit like me, that's the one I'm going to download. And it'll come down as a zip file. And here's that zip file. I've opened it up. And here are is the contents of that zip file. And I'm going to drag the contents of that zip file over to this uh, Explorer window, this folder that I've created somewhere on my hard drive. And when I do that, I can then run raceflightconfigurator.exe and the raceflight configurator will start up and my copter is already plugged in, waiting to go. And there we go. 
Now the steps for setting up the copter really could not be simpler. Uh, they are right here. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is actually not the order that the steps in the install guide go in, but since they're right here numbered, let's just go ahead and run through them in order. Step one, set up the flight controller. What we're gonna do here is place the quadcopter flat and click next, and then place the quadcopter on its nose and click next. And what this is doing is it's allowing race flight to determine the orientation of the board. So you may know that in beta flight and clean flight, you've got the board align setting. And if board align is not correct, then uh, the quadcopter will flip out when you try to go fly, right? Yaw, uh, you board align, you know, yaw negative 90 if you've got it turned to the side, etc. Race flight auto detect that so you can install the board facing whatever direction you feel is appropriate and then it'll auto detect what the alignment is and make its configuration correct. And this is a trend we're going to see continue. Uh, Race flight 1 has lots of really cool wizards uh, to detect and set up everything that you need to set up. Next, we'll detect the receiver. Uh, the radio is turned on. My receiver is bound. They are connected. And if we hit next, it's scanning through the UARTs and trying to figure out what's attached. And eventually, it will finish doing that. And it has detected my receiver. And the next thing we'll do is we'll run through the radio setup wizard. So I'm going to hit next here, and I'm going to move the sticks in complete circles a few times. So here, uh, the wizard is figuring out the endpoints for my channels. And then I'm going to place the throttle at idle and click OK. Set the throttle to the top. Here it's figuring out the channel mapping. Pitch to the top and roll to the right. And now arming switch in the disarmed position, yes. And arming switch to the armed position. Done. And it's automatically figured out that my arming channel is channel five and in the low position, my copter is armed. Done. This is something that I would love to see Betaflight do more of, uh, and, and CleanFlight too, and really everybody else. Wizards like this, uh, you know, I've started seeing the wizards like this in the simulators, right? When you set up your, your controller in the simulators, and there's absolutely no reason why, especially for the, for the channel mapping and endpoints, that can't be something that's automated, and kudos to RaceFlight1 for doing that. Next, we're going to update the ESCs. Uh, a difference, a thing you might not be used to if you're not coming uh, from the race flight environment already is that race flight handles all of the ESC integration by itself. You're not ever going to touch BL Heli Suite uh, if you're running race flight one. And I think that may also be true. I think that's also true for old style race flight as well. Um, so it'll flash the ESCs to the latest firmware. And what that means is that when BL Heli comes out with a new firmware, RaceFlight 1 is going to come out with a new version of its configurator app that contains that firmware, and you can just flash, you can do everything from within RaceFlight 1. So we hit Update ESCs. I have removed the props, and I'm going to connect the battery, and I am going to use my smoke stopper, like always, on the bench. Okay. I can't help but think as this is going on that this hopefully this all goes smoothly, and it did go smoothly for me the first time I did this. Uh, I, I can't help but wonder if this didn't go smoothly, what would you need to do? You know, what I've what I've done in the what I what I did in the past uh, when I when I tried I, I tried to install an earlier version of Race Flight One that was not quite as polished. I ran into some issues, and uh, I had to be fed a whole bunch of command line options. Uh, that were really kind of confusing, and I'm sure that some people have them memorized, but I didn't, uh, and it was a lot harder for me than just going into BL Heli Suite and clicking menu options. So, the, you know, the upside of these wizards is that they make things really simple uh, for anybody to use, but if they do go wrong, I do have to wonder, you know, how hard is it going to be to figure out what went wrong and fix it? Uh, if everything is supposed to be automated. It's kind of the Apple versus Android philosophy in a way. You know, Apple wants to sort of curate your experience and make everything easy and automatic, but if it if what they want for you isn't exactly what you want, you're kind of out in the cold. We'll go back to setup. ESCs are updated. They're on the latest version. 
Next we'll calibrate the motors. I have removed the props and disconnected the battery. So here we're going to do basically throttle calibration. If we were doing D-shot, I suppose we wouldn't need this step, but we're not. Okay, calibrated, and then finally motor direction and idle. Props off, battery connected, okay. Yes, they're spinning. I have to wonder, I don't know if you caught that, it said set idle percent to 5, set idle percent to 4. I have to wonder if uh, it was doing something with the gyro or something to detect when the motor started spinning. I don't know, maybe it did something clever there. Okay, we'll start the motors. The motors will now begin spinning and you can check the motor direction. And what I like to do to check the motor direction is what I like to do to check the motor direction is take something like a zip tie or here I've got a little gift card and just hold it in the motor and like like a like a playing card in a bicycle spoke, see which way it pushes it just to confirm that the motor really is moving the direction that it seems to be moving. Sometimes when I feel with my finger, it's not always clear. Um, that's what I like to do. The motors are spinning the right direction, and that's it. <laughs> I think we're good to fly. Uh, that's your basic setup, and that's just how quick and easy it could be. There's other things we could set up, but I'm not gonna do that right now. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll just take, take a look through what else is in here. Uh, in configuration, we have the option to set up telemetry. Uh, I haven't set up, to, I have actually wired telemetry. I've wired smart port telemetry. Um, if we look at the wiring guide, we can see that it shows this, uh, the XSR. We've got smart port telemetry and SBUS going to the same UART. Now, that's not something that Betaflight has uh, been able to do, uh, at least not yet. Uh, and it, uh, when I first saw this, I was really impressed that Raceflight had pulled this off. In theory, there's nothing stopping you from having a transmit protocol, which is SmartPort. Actually, SmartPort's bi-directional now, but you could even do that on a single pin if you were if you were really clever. And the Raceflight guys are definitely pulling off some interesting and clever things. Um, so when I saw that, I was super impressed. Uh, but then I see here in the configurator that the Tyrannus telemetry needs to be on the RX3 pin, uh, where not the RX1 pin. So maybe maybe they didn't pull that off. I don't know. Uh, so I haven't got telemetry enabled right now, and I'm not even sure I've got it wired up correctly. In the mixer here, we have the option to reverse prop direction. And what that is, there's a thing that some people like to do where instead of the prop spinning away from the camera or spinning towards the camera in front, they spin away from the camera in front, and the rear props are also reversed. Uh, some people say that has aerodynamic benefits. Uh, it improves handling. Other people say it has no difference at all. Uh, and some, the main thing that people seem to like is that it, when you get into the grass, it doesn't throw the grass onto the camera lens. It throws it away from the camera lens. So that's the thing you could do. If you do tick this box, make sure you put your props on backwards as well. Pid tuning. Well, obviously we'll be doing some pid tuning or maybe we won't. I hear the default pids from race flight are darn near perfect. Well, we'll find out about that once I get into the air. Here's the options for rates. I'm going to leave them at the default rates right now just to get the sort of pure default race flight experience. But you do have the option to set KISS rates and beta flight rates if you want to come over from something you're used to flying. Presumably, they're emulating those rate curves somehow. In fact, in the case of an open source software like beta flight, they could just copy the calculations exactly uh, and duplicate those rates. It wouldn't be too hard to reverse engineer something like KISS rates. I mean, you have the ability to play with them and see what rates they end up with. So figuring out the formulas shouldn't be that difficult. Here's the ESC tab where we can configure the timing and the beep strength and the startup power for the ESCs. Very basic thing there. And logging. This is for black box logging where we can download the flight logs. And the console where we can enter all those console commands, <laughs> you know, and finally firmware updating. Now we're on the latest firmware right now, but as new firmware has come out, hopefully we'll just click a button and flash to the newest firmware. Maybe we won't even have to redo our whole configuration when we update. Wouldn't that be nice? And that's going to do it. That's going to bring us to the end of this video. I have a race flight copter, presumably ready to fly, and I am looking forward to getting it in the air and showing you what my first flight experiences are like. Uh, but for now, 
Hope you've enjoyed this little walk through the RaceFlight 1 configurator app and a quick uh, view of what it's like to set up the first RaceFlight copter. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Happy flying.